Imagine for a moment that you could hold the energy equivalent of your entire life in your hands. I'm not talking metaphorically. I'm literally talking about a rock the size of a golf ball that contains enough energy to power all your appliances, your car, your heating, and every light bulb in your house for the next 80 years. That rock exists, and it's called thorium. But here's the strange thing. We've known how to use it for over half a century, and yet we've chosen to ignore it almost completely. But why? The answer will surprise you as much as the implications of what's happening now. Today, we're going to explore together one of the most promising and paradoxically neglected technologies of our time, thorium reactors. I assure you, by the end of this video, you'll see nuclear energy through completely different eyes. To understand why thorium is so special, you first need to know its history. We go back to 1965 at the laboratories in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. There, a group of scientists led by Alvin Weinberg achieved something extraordinary. They operated the world's first thorium molten salt reactor for four consecutive years. There were no accidents, no safety issues, and it demonstrated an energy efficiency that dwarfed conventional uranium reactors. It was, by all indicators, the future of nuclear power. But then, the Cold War arrived, and everything changed. Uranium reactors had one advantage that thorium couldn't offer. They produced plutonium, the essential ingredient for nuclear weapons. The thorium program was cancelled, the documents archived, and for decades the world forgot about this revolutionary technology. Until now. Thorium is a fascinating element that challenges everything you thought you knew about nuclear fuel. Unlike uranium, thorium-232 is not fissile on its own, meaning it can't sustain a nuclear chain reaction directly. But here's the kicker. When you bombard thorium-232 with neutrons, it transforms into uranium-233, which is fissile and can sustain a controlled reaction. It's like having fuel that creates itself as you use it. This process typically occurs in molten salt reactors, where the fuel isn't in solid rods as in traditional reactors, but dissolved in a mixture of liquid salts that simultaneously act as fuel and coolant. Imagine a reactor where the fuel is literally liquid, flowing through the system like blood through your veins, carrying energy to every corner of the reactor. In the design of a two-fluid molten salt breeder reactor, the mixture of fuel salts, such as lithium, beryllium, and uranium fluorides, is pumped through graphite tubes in the reactor core, where heat is generated by uranium fission, and then through the primary heat exchanger, where this heat is extracted. The fertile, or mantle, salt surrounds the core, where additional heat is generated. It is then pumped through the mantle heat exchanger, where this heat is extracted. The mantle salt mixture contains thorium, which converts to fissile uranium atoms faster than they are consumed in the reactor fuel. The heat produced in the fuel and mantle streams is transferred via an intermediate salt heat transfer system to a supercritical vapor stream electric generator. In an alternative design, a salt containing thorium and uranium circulates through the reactor vessel and heat exchanges. This simpler single fluid reactor is also a promising breeder reactor if the problems of inline fuel processing can be resolved. Thorium's advantages over uranium are so overwhelming that it seems too good to be true. The first advantage is abundance. Thorium is approximately three times more common than uranium in the Earth's crust. China alone has sufficient reserves to cover its energy needs for the next 20,000 years. India, which has the world's largest thorium reserves, could become an energy superpower overnight. The second advantage is energy efficiency. One kilogram of thorium can generate up to 200 times more energy 
than one kilogram of uranium. This means reactors can be much smaller and still produce enormous amounts of energy. The third advantage is inherent safety. Molten salt reactors have a passive safety system. If anything goes wrong, the molten salts simply drain by gravity into safe tanks, automatically stopping the reaction. No human intervention is required. There is no possibility of a core meltdown. In 2023, China achieved something that forever changed the global energy landscape. They launched the first commercial thorium molten salt reactor in the Gobi Desert. It was no coincidence that they chose the desert. These reactors don't need water for cooling, unlike traditional nuclear reactors. But here comes the most ironic part of this whole story. China built its reactor using declassified American research from the 1960s. They took the Oak Ridge plans, improved them with modern technology, and achieved in just a few years what the United States had abandoned decades earlier. Kirk Sorensen, a NASA engineer who rediscovered these documents while searching for energy solutions for future lunar colonies, had tried unsuccessfully to spark American interest. While he fought bureaucracy, China saw an opportunity and dove headlong into the future. This is where the story gets really exciting. Remember I mentioned lunar colonies? Thorium isn't just revolutionary for Earth, it could be the key to making long-term space exploration viable. On the Moon, thorium's electromagnetic signatures make it easy to detect and extract. Imagine a lunar base that can mine its own nuclear fuel, eliminating dependence on terrestrial supplies. Thorium reactors are perfect for space. They don't need water, are compact, extremely efficient, and produce waste that becomes safe in a few centuries, not tens of thousands of years. A small thorium reactor could power a Martian colony for months or supply a spacecraft during its journey to Mars. This isn't science fiction. It's engineering waiting to be developed. But not everything is perfect in the world of thorium. The technology, although conceptually proven, still faces significant challenges for mass commercial implementation. The biggest problem is materials science. Molten salts operate at extremely high temperatures and are highly corrosive. Special alloys such as Hastelloy N are required, which are expensive and complicated to produce. Furthermore, although thorium is abundant, processing it into usable fuel requires specialized infrastructure that currently does not exist on a large scale. Critics also point out that some of thorium's benefits have been exaggerated by its proponents. Previous commercial attempts in Germany, India, and the United States during the 1980s failed primarily for economic reasons. Developing thorium reactors requires massive, long-term investments, something that has historically been difficult to justify when uranium was abundant and cheap. But times are changing, and rapidly. Climate change has put nuclear power back at the center of the global energy debate, and thorium offers a cleaner, safer version of this technology. China isn't the only country betting big. They plan to build a 60 megawatt reactor by 2030. Copenhagen Atomics, a Danish company, wants to test its own thorium molten salt reactor in Switzerland by 2026. India has resumed its research programs with renewed vigor. Even in the United States, several startups are exploring the technology their own country helped create. The convergence of the climate crisis, the need for energy security, and advances in materials science is creating the perfect moment for thorium to finally fulfill its 60-year-old promise. If these projects succeed, we could be witnessing the dawn of a new energy era. The story of thorium is, in many ways, a story of opportunities lost and found. For decades, the world chose weapons over clean energy, politics over science, short-termism over the future. But powerful ideas have a peculiar way of resurfacing when the world is finally ready for them. As we contemplate the challenges of climate change, 
and dream of expanding to the stars, Thorium offers us a second chance we cannot afford to squander. The question is no longer whether the technology works, but whether we have the vision and the will to implement it before it's too late.